Hey, it's Robert Krolwich from Radio Lab. Jad and I, uh, we want to invite you to a party. Uh, we've already had the party, so this is a tardy invitation. Uh, it was with Lulu Miller at Invisibilia and PJ and Alex from Reply All, Lauren Lapkus from her crazily wonderful special guest, Lauren Lapkus. And you can join our party by simply going to the video of it. I have to confess, we've already had it. We missed you, but you don't have to miss us. Just go to castparty.org, click, and there we are. All of us laughing a lot. Oh, wait, you're listening. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. <coughs> you're listening, listening to Radio Lab. Radio Lab. From WNYC. See? See? Yeah. So, okay, you ready? Mm hmm. Hey, I'm Jad Abumrad. I'm Robert Krolwich. This is Radio Lab. And we're getting ready for, well, this whole podcast you're about to hear is an invitation to join us in the next podcast. Uh, we will be going. Happy birthday! <laughs> to you. Not a second year! Happy this is not, I hate Facebook. I hate that everybody knows this. And there's so many of them. Jesus! <laughs> You, ladies and gentlemen, are witnessing the death of privacy. <laughs> yeah, so that happened. We thought we'd throw it in. Anyhow, back to the flow. So it's, I'm Jan, I'm Robert. Earth, this is Radio Lab. And this particular episode is more or less an invitation for you to get ready for the next episode. Yeah, today we have a preview of a an episode that we are working on furiously right now uh, about the periodic table of elements. We're going to tell uh, individual stories about the different elements, and those stories are going to take us into outer space, into deep man-made holes in the middle of America, into our cells, all kinds of places. So this week, we decided to make a small telescoped uh, preview in which we go to one apartment in one building in the city of New York, occupied by the rather singular Dr. Oliver Sacks. <laughs> we should say this was a visit we paid to him about six, seven years right. ago, I think. And um, this is the story that, in a very real way, inspired us to do uh, this upcoming episode about the elements. And we also know, by the way, that Oliver isn't, isn't feeling so well right now, yeah. which makes it particularly wonderful to hear him in, in joy. Off we go. I think there's always been a desire to somehow categorize and classify the world around us. Remember it? And when you were in, I don't know when it would be, like in eighth grade, when they, when the teacher comes in in general science and he pulls down the periodic table of elements? Remember oh, yeah, that? sure. I mean, that was one of the first times where I was like, yeah, I don't want to be a scientist. <laughs> it's not for me. But for kids who love this kind of thing, take Oliver Sacks, for example. Yeah, Chad, you should come in. I should come in? Okay. Yeah, so a couple of years ago, we had went to talk to Oliver Sacks about something. Well, it was actually mostly you that was going to talk to him, and I was just tacking along for the hell of it. Yep. And for some reason, we ended up in his bathroom. I tend to read a little bit in the toilet. Maybe to look at a book or something? He seems to have facts and figures in his as well. There's a lot of us in there. I'm sorry. Sorry. And that's when uh, we noticed. Well, you have a periodic uh, chart in the bathroom. In every, in every bathroom. <laughs> but he had a periodic table of the elements on the wall in the bathroom. So here we are. We thought, wow, how funny. Periodic table in the bathroom. But then he said, well, you know, if you go out into the couch, you'll see <laughs> table cushions. some cushions embroidered with the periodic table. And then he took us to his bedroom. Although I don't usually take people into my bedroom. Oh, we'll come. <laughs> where he showed us his periodic table comforter. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tend to sleep here right under tungsten. <laughs> but the cool part was when he took us to the living room, where he had this... Uh, well, describe what isn't before us here. It um, looks like an altar. It's like a little, a little dictionary stand on top of which was a beautiful mahogany box. A fine wooden box. About the size of a backgammon set. Called Periodic Table of the Elements. It is a very fine wooden box. Uh, and, and if you care to open it... Right, it's... it's, it's uh, it's made of some sort of fine wood. It comes from Russia. It does. All right. And is there a trick to opening this? Um. Ooh. Okay, so we've all seen the periodic table you know, on a chart, but in Oliver's box, there, there were the actual elements. Oh, these are all these. We have here like 90 some odd little uh, 
little tubes, little samples. Little teeny vials. Of almost all the elements. Silver, arsenic, bismuth, cobalt, oxygen, copper, hydrogen, phosphorus, iron, manganese, mercury, nitrogen, molybdenum, gold. Since I'm, for example, having my 72nd birthday tomorrow, yes. and element 72 is hafnium, there is a little hafnium. Um, Two little rocks. Here, here's what here's what they sound like if you rattle them. I, I, I have coming to me, I hope it arrives today, an ingot of hafnium, which would be very much more satisfying. <laughs> um, what would you do with an ingot that you can't do with the two little pebbles? Uh, I'll be able to hold it in my hand. My first love of chemistry had to do with the, the sensuous. So here, one of the liquid elements, bromine. I, I loved the colors, the kind brown. Of faintly brown, fluidy thing. Um, yeah, the luster, pale golden mercury. Very very beautiful. The the physical properties. Oh, this is a gas trapped in little vial? Yes. Uh, one, one wouldn't want to drop that. Why not? Uh, well, it's it's not good to breathe. Can I just jump in here for a second? Sure. Because um, I, I, I really need to jump in. <laughs> but the thing that's really crazy about that box, and this you don't get from uh, from looking at a periodic chart on the wall, is that all those elements? Lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, That's like sodium, neon, the world. I mean, everything that we can see and perceive, this table right here, the teeth in my mouth, the sky, the ocean, the mountains, it's all made of some combination of elements from that box. And the box itself gives it all a deep, deep order. I had noticed myself, one can't help noticing, that the elements are organized in a very special sort of way. For uh, example... May I excuse you for a moment? I, I, I have managed to not notice. I find it a little odd that you could organize them at all. I, I don't even know how to begin the, the process of figuring out they're okay. related in some um, way. Well, well, then, then you are sort of um, recapitulating what, you know, what, what everyone felt in the, in the early days. Of course, in the really early days, people thought there were just four elements. The ancient notion of elements uh, took the form of earth, air, fire, and water. Basically, the thought that the whole world could be composed of these four ingredients in different ways. But then, in the 18th century, we're skipping ahead a bit, yep. chemists began to break things down into uh, smaller pieces, like wind became... Gases like oxygen and hydrogen and nitrogen. And Earth got divided up into things like sulfur, phosphorus, iron. And eventually, chemists got all the way down to the root of it, which was the atom. That's really what an element is. It's a particular kind of atom. The problem was, though, when chemists began to start measuring these atoms, they found that they were all different sizes and types. Like one would be heavy, another would be light. Third one would be really friendly, likes to link up with other atoms, whereas the fourth would be a loner. And they would come in combinations like heavy, friendly, heavy, shy, light, friendly, light, shy. What was the pattern? That was the question. Could they fit all of these differences and similarities into one big schema? Since we mentioned his name, let me here show you a picture of the... Um, um, Here's where we get to Oliver's hero. The Siberian bigamist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as he is called. That would be Dmitry Mendeleev. The great Mendeleev, whom we will talk about. Oliver has a black and white picture of him on uh, his kitchen cabinet. This man is not going to win any any beauty contest. Um, no, no, no he, uh, he looks like a mixture between uh, Rasputin and... Um, uh, who do I mean? Well, you mean he has a big nose, a shaggy, slightly unkempt white beard, a mustache that goes all over the place, piercing eyes, thick eyebrows, and looks like he's in a hunchback position. Generally, if you met him on the sidewalk, you'd probably want to walk around him. <laughs> yeah, he didn't believe in wasting time going to a barber. Well, let me just ask you, as to the degree of your passion, when you look at this man, do you think he's a beautiful-looking guy, or do you see what I see? Um, I think Mendeleev had a beautiful mind. And when that mind gets on a train, and it was a long, long ride from Irkutsk to Moscow, strange things will happen, as you're about to hear. We'll be right back. My name's Annalise, and I'm calling right before going to bed in Des Moines, Iowa. Radio Lab is supported in part by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, enhancing public understanding of science and technology in the modern world. More information about Sloan at www.sloan.org. 
Radio Lab is supported by Morgan Stanley, who believes that a healthier population enriches all lives. Juno Therapeutics, working to revolutionize how cancer is treated, turned to Morgan Stanley to help raise the necessary capital. With funding secured through one of the largest biotech IPOs in history, Juno is developing innovative treatments that use the body's own immune system to detect and kill cancer cells, doing the work to make breakthroughs possible. Capital creates change. MorganStanley.com slash Juno, Morgan Stanley & Co. LLC, member SIPC. Hey, I'm Jad Abumrad. I'm Robert Krolwich. This is Radio Lab. And we're going to go back to Oliver Sacks talking about his hero, Dmitry Mendeleev, now about to take a trip. Okay. In 1860, uh, around 1860, there were trains going all over Russia, and Mendeleev could afford to take trains. He was often on enormous journeys, and to while away the time, since he couldn't do chemical experiments or whatever, he would take playing cards with the name of various elements, their chemical and physical properties, and he would play what he called chemical solitaire. Sorting them for likeness or sorting uh, them? Well, I'm afraid I, 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 I don't know the details. But you know what we can imagine, right? Sure. So let's just say he's there sitting there on the train, he's looking out the window, he sees trees made of carbon. Carbon. A lake made of hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen, oxygen. Behind that, a mountain. Mountains, yeah. Made of silica. Silica. And he's shuffling their properties and their atomic weights in his mind. Wondering. How do these things go together? What's What's the the pattern? pattern? And he's shuffling. I'm shuffling. 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 And he did this for years. Until one night. This we think is true. In February of 1869, he is said to have had a dream. In his dream, all the atoms of all the elements of all the world, the fat ones, the small ones, the dense ones, the heavy ones, the friendly ones, the shy ones, they all began to dance in his mind. And then they snapped into a grid. He awoke with a vision of the periodic table. This is one of those (laughs) dreams, which he then wrote on the back of an envelope. The thing about what he wrote on the back of that envelope is that it starts out so simply. Left to right, the atoms just get heavier and heavier and heavier. Heavier, heavier, heavier. heavier. But every so often, and this is what he intuited in his dream, is that while they're getting heavier, their other traits, like whether they're shy or magnetic or whatever, those traits oh. repeat. Periodically change back again. And every time they do, we start a new row. The properties repeat again. <laughs> Out of this simple repeating structure, Very nice hush, Mendeleev, you get a table that you can read in a million ways. There are so many ways to read this table. I think I'm going to call this the periodic table. (laughs) That if you use your imagination, you can see yourself in there. I I was a rather shy kid with uh, uh, difficulty forming relationships. Um, And I sometimes compared myself to the inert gases. Inert gases are very isolated. They react with nothing. Because I, I felt they, they too had difficulties forming relationships. But um, I did... Uh, he has now left the chair and has moved to the library and is taking out any hugely thick, actually a dangerously thick book. This is the Handbook of Physics and Chemistry. As you see, it has 5,000 pages. I had a smaller version as a boy, and um, from brooding in this book, it seemed to me just possible that one of the inert gases, xenon, might be seduced into combination by the most active element of all, which was fluorine. This lonely, lonely gas might find a partner somehow. Um, yeah. Did they ever get together? In fact, it came to me with great joy when I found out uh, in the 1960s that a, actually a Canadian chemist uh, had, in fact, made a fluoride of xenon. Ah, ah yes. Elemental love. <laughs> and speaking of love, he then took us... I think let's come right. here. All One right. sec. Where are we going? Okay. To the living room. And he showed us a small painting. In the painting, there was this dramatic figure of a bearded, 
scowling character on the side of a mountain, holding two stone tablets over his head, and the sky was filled with lightning. And who was it? It was Dmitry Mendeleev. When I heard of how Mendeleev had um, discovered the periodic table, I imagined Mendeleev as a sort of Moses going up to a chemical Sinai and coming down with the tablets of the periodic law. And when I mentioned this fantasy to Peter Selgin, my friend, uh, uh, an artist, uh, he did this imaginative picture of the young Mendeleev, the peaks of a chemical Sinai behind him, holding aloft the tablets of the periodic table. Which raises maybe the deepest question of all. Did Mendeleev think this up and impose it upon the world? Or was this pattern always there? In which case Mendeleev just removed the veil and said, oh, there you are. Is the periodic table a discovery or an invention? Is it a human construct or is it a revelation of the cosmic or divine order? Is it, so to speak, God's abacus? <laughs> Okay, so that was our visit with, wow, did I just get carried away with the sound. Right. So, yes, it is a little bit closet cluttered, but It was a still, long time ago. It was a long time ago. <laughs> Anyhow, that was our visit to Oliver Sacks and uh, also a preview to an upcoming episode that we're making right now about elements, which we're really excited about. I hope you'll be back for that. In the meantime, I'm Robert Krolwich. I'm Jad Abumrad. This is Radio Lab. Thanks for listening. Hi, this is Jumana calling from Khobar, Saudi Arabia. Radio Lab is produced by Jad Abumrad. Our staff includes Rena Farrell, Ellen Horn, David Gable, Dylan Keefe, Matt Keelty, Andy Mills, Latif Nasser, Kelsey Patchett, Ariane Wack, Molly Webster, Sarin Wheeler, and Jamie York. With help from Damiano Marchetti, Molly McBride Jacobson, Alexandra Lee Young, Kathy Tu, and Simon Adler. Our fact checkers are Eva Dasher and Michelle Harris.